Hi, and welcome back to Latin American Studies 201, Popular Culture in Latin America, with John Beasley Murray. So today we're going to talk about folk tales and legends, and we're going to look particularly at two folk tales, uh, Jose Maria Aguirre's The Pongo's Dream, and Miguel Angel Asturias's the legend of the silent bell. I'm going to talk mostly in this discussion about notions of the folk and how that works out particularly in Latin America. So let's talk about the folk particular as a, uh, the term itself. In some ways to speak of folk culture is simply to speak about of popular culture in that the folk are the people. What we have here is, as we often have in English, we have two words for the same concept. In the English comes, has these two traditions which, which come together. We often have one word deriving from Anglo-Saxon and so Germanic languages. So the German for the people is Volk and the other from Latin and that's where we get popular. So strictly speaking, these terms uh, mean the same and folk tales are simply like simply popular tales, um, folk culture is just another way of saying popular culture. And yet, yeah, things get a little bit complicated because whenever we do have a linguistic difference, whenever we have two words that seem to mean almost exactly the same thing, there's a tendency to make that difference meaningful, to, to assume or to project some kind of difference in meaning between two terms that may originally have uh, exactly the same uh, connotations. So in practice, the folk of folk tales and folk music and folk culture and so on tends to be a very specific version of the popular, or rather encodes a particular way of thinking about the popular and popular culture. And, and specifically, this is a version of the popular or a vision of the popular which is more aligned with the notion that the popular, the folk, represent a, a vanishing pre-modern world of usually rural life and customs. That the folk are associated often with the peasantry, people working the land, with tradition. Uh, in short, what the British theorist Raymond Williams called the residual. He divided up uh, culture into three aspects. The residual, the dominant and the emergent. And when we start talking about the folk, we're, we're talking about, or uh, we're thinking of the popular in terms of uh, uh, traditions that, that come from the past and maybe in the process of, of disappearing. So hence there's this impulse to, to collect folk culture, um, folk tales, folk music, whatever, um, uh, with the fear, but also the expectation perhaps, uh, that it is soon about to disappear. So there's therefore an ideological difference. This is not just a, a difference in signification. There's an ideological difference between the folk and the people. Words, after all, are never politically neutral. A and the folk, which is, is seen as this, this disappearing remnant, this residue of some past age, uh, are often cast in romanticized terms. It's often a nostalgia. On the one hand, celebrates what has supposedly disappeared or is on the verge of disappearance. Uh, hence the attempt to reclaim, to document uh, what uh, seems to be being replaced by mod the modern, by mass culture, um, by uh, mechanical reproduction, for instance. While begging the question of that disappearance, the the notion of that disappearance is never itself questioned, whether in fact it's true or what its implications might be. So there are certain presumptions that, uh, that precisely that modernity replaces the popular, for instance, that this is a form of progress, even if it has these lamentable side uh, effects. Um, the development means uh, casting off or leaving behind certain cultural forms that are encoded in, when we start talking about the folk, or encoded in the language of the folk, in an, an assumption that the folk are gradually, or perhaps quickly, being replaced by the people. If we look specifically about the way in which this resonates, or this kind of discourse uh, resonates, uh, 
in Latin America, we should perhaps be especially careful, careful about our use of a t this, this term, a term such as the folk in, in Latin America, as uh, the folk are inevitably overlaid onto a concept of the indigenous. So folk tales and folk culture more generally are then indigenous stories, which again are at the same time celebrated and erased from the present. Now it's true this division between the folk and the popular is a linguistic division that is specific to English, but this is an attitude of simultaneous celebration and erasure that is uh, a common one or has been a common one in uh, Latin American culture as well, even if it, we don't have the linguistic terms uh, to identify or, or mark it. Now, this is not to say that we can't use the term. In fact, I think there's a certain use to be able to distinguish between the folk and the, and the popular or between the attitudes that those two terms encode or those two terms uh, reproduce, but we should use it carefully and think about its implications. Uh, the, its implications. Uh, we should think about some of the consequences of using such a term and the, and the ideological presuppositions that go with it. Uh, let's talk about folk tales and legends, specifically as genres, as, as literary genres, uh, broadly speaking, uh, literary, as narrative genres. Uh, folk tales like fairy tales and nursery rhymes, folk music, and other similar instances of, of popular culture. First of all, they tend to be oral. They're, they don't depend on the written word. Uh, they tend uh, to be uh, spoken uh, or sung or whatever. And, and they're collective. You would envisage, precisely because they're, they're oral, you, you envisage a sort of a, a, a community event or within a family that they're passed down. And also because they, uh, they're collective in another sense in that they don't necessarily have a single author or, or, or not a single author that can be identified. They sort of get passed down. And as they get passed down, they also may change. They're dynamic in that way. They may be adapted and rewritten or respoken or reinvented to suit particular purposes or to suit particular occasions, or simply because you know, the, the person who is retelling the story forgets bits and adds bits and improvises. These three aspects, therefore, go together because they're performed or handed down orally. It's hard to locate any particular origin or author, and they can easily be changed, either by circumstance, by happenstance, or to suit new contexts and needs. Then there's this, I mean, how do we, how do we study or, or how do we examine such things? We, we depend upon uh, collecting and writing down these tales. And that, hence the, the drive to, to collect and to capture in some ways. But, but that's how uh, they become reproduced in different mediascapes, right? In the, in the kind of um, media ecology in which most of us now now live in which the written word or mechanical reproduction is is much more dominant but collecting and writing down these tales enables us to read them or study them or, or just appreciate them but it fixes them and puts an end to that dynamic that dynamism it changes their mode it changes something essential uh, uh, about them and in a sense, it therefore both preserves and kills them at the same time. A little bit more about uh, folk tales and, and, and legends. Uh, folk tales often have a didactic or moral purpose. Uh, they aim to teach a lesson. They uh, have some kind of takeaway. They um, point to a particular value that they try to establish or consolidate which may often be in opposition to or resistant to values and priorities imposed from above. And one of the interesting things about folk tales in that, um, again, precisely because of, um, and especially in Latin America, but not only in Latin America, precisely because of people's unequal access to the written world, uh, folk tales are a way of tapping into perhaps a collective consciousness from below.
tapping into the ways in which people think about um, everyday life, um, but particularly the structures of power that uh, frame everyday life too. Folk tales and uh, perhaps especially legends also often have an explanatory purpose. They try to explain how the world is, how the world became, why things are as they are. And in, in this sense, and there's an ambivalence therefore built into folk culture and folk tales, they may be conservative because to, to explain something is also, or can also be to legitimate something, to say, ah, oh, there are these, these reasons. There's some kind of explanation for the way the world is, and um, that's why things are. So that's the way things are, and um, there's nothing much to be done, or rather, it's in the hands of some higher power, or some antecedent uh, tradition. In other words, they make what may seem to be contingent, uh, may seem to be accidental or unnecessary, they, they can frame them as if they were necessary, as if they had their, their reasons, albeit mythic. So the political valence of folk culture is uncertain, is variable and unpredictable. It can be a consolation or compensation, or it can perhaps be read as a call to action, as a form of resistance, or as a call to resistance of some sort as the assertion of another set of values, another way of seeing the world. I think we can't decide in advance uh, exactly how folk tales work out. It depends perhaps in different contexts, they may be read in different ways. And again, part of their dynamic, they may be retold in different ways, in different circumstances, with different valences, even if the underlying text is the same or is, is similar. Folk tales in Latin America. Again, we should over, note the overlap between folk culture and indigenous culture, while at the same time being wary of the implications of the term we use, and also noting that that overlap is far from complete. In other words, folk culture is not simply indigenous culture. Um, uh, folk culture uh, is um, might also be, I don't know, gaucho culture in Argentina, for instance, right? There are, there are other uh, elements of the rural peasantry, for instance, which are not necessarily indigenous, depending on the, the particular country. Uh, and as well, uh, indigenous culture, um, we, could, we could frame indigenous culture in different ways rather than simply seeing it through the, the lens of the, uh, of the folk. Uh, folk culture is one of the ways in which indigenous influences actually seep into general culture as, as a whole, becoming everyday, if not unacknowledged. In other words, we may also want to think about the ways in which indigenous cultures are also modern or offer other forms of modernity or are commentaries upon modernity. Again, we'll see it in the, we'll see this, I think, in the particular stories that we examine uh, later on in, in this discussion. Uh, and also we'll see that the romantic view of an untouched indigeneity uh, is precisely that. It's a romantic invention of the modern imagination. In other words, it's a projection upon the past. It's a projection upon the indigenous. It's a project projection upon uh, from those, uh, from the lettered elite on the, the unlettered majority. And with both these two examples, the, the Legend of the Silent Bell and the, the Pongo's Dream, we see a process of writing or rewriting, recomposition, recomposing of indigenous culture on the part of letrados, uh, people with access to the written word, well-intentioned, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, but who are therefore fundamentally changing uh, the nature of the material uh, on which they're working, both preserving and, and killing. And so we shouldn't lose sight of the effects of this, what we call remediatization, this transformation from one medium, oral, collective, to another, uh, written, um, authored, uh, which gives us access to this, these stories and at the same time perhaps obscures them or obscures some elements of them. <laughs> 
to look at the context of these two particular stories, uh, Peru and Guatemala are among the countries in Latin America with the highest proportion of indigenous people in their populations. It depends on how you count, how you define indigeneity, um, but up to perhaps 40%, 50% perhaps uh, in, both, uh, in both Guatemala and Peru might arguably be reckoned to be indigenous, e even today. And note that these two stories we're looking at uh, come from um, the early to mid 20th century when that was even more the case. Um, Argetus, the first half, uh, Astoria, sorry, the first half of the 20th century, Argetus' uh, story is published in, in the 1960s, in, in, in 1967, I think. Um, but again, given this context of uh, countries of a large indigenous population, it can even more seem that the folk and the popular uh, overlap. Uh, and what we have in, in both countries, of course, are also the sites of two of the great pre-Columbian civilizations, uh, the Inca and the Maya, which uh, are sort of the backdrop of uh, much discussion or thinking about indigeneity in those two countries. And, and perhaps, therefore, also the interest in folk culture um, as ways to reckon with both that indigenous past and its everyday contemporary legacies. Hence, perhaps, the, the impulse to collect and preserve, uh, memorialize, and at the same time transform indigenous narratives and, and ways of thinking. We should say a little about the, the people who are sort of the named authors of these two tales, Jose Maria Arguedas and Miguel Angel Asturias. I mean, they're both representatives, um, representative of, of high culture, if only as writers and authors, uh, letrados. Uh, each of them is among their country's most renowned uh, writers, especially true of Asturias, a uh, Nobel Pri Prize winning novelist, uh, whose understanding of indigenous culture is filtered through his experiences in Paris he goes and he studies in, in Paris and in the Sorbonne, uh, associates himself with surrealism, uh, and, but also the ethnographic anthropological impulse, and, and returns with a sort of renewed interest in, um, in, in indigenous culture in his, his homeland, uh, Guatemala, but filtered through uh, some of those attitudes and ideas uh, picked up uh, in Europe. Uh, both Arguedas and Astorias uh, also demonstrate a relationship between indigenous or folk culture and high culture, both as collectors and in Argetus' case as a translator, um, and insofar as their novels often draw on myths, legends, and popular beliefs in, in different ways. So again, I'm not going to go into the authorial biography too much of um, both authors, though they're both quite interesting. Uh, again, that seemed to be that that would seem to be putting too much weight on uh, these uh, individual names uh, where again what they're doing is they're taking up this this collective culture but we should be aware of again their role as mediators or re-mediators and, and in this process they both show the distance between high culture and popular culture and at the same time the contigu contiguity or closeness mutual dependence uh, between the two. In both The Pongo's Dream and The Legend of the Silent Bell, uh, if we were looking for some kind of uncontaminated indigenous culture, you know, sort of authentic, um, untouched, uh, isolated from Western or colonial ways of thinking, uh, we'd obviously be disappointed. That's not what either of these stories gives us. That doesn't mean there aren't other stories that at least purport to give us that, um, but at least these two examples, that's very clearly not what we're getting. Uh, and in the, itself that challenges perhaps a little bit our ideas or our assumptions as to what indigenous or folk culture uh, might be. Um, because here we have stories that clearly register the impact of conquest and colonization. 
I mean, different ways, both are critical commentaries on that impact, their responses to um, the colonial project. At the same time, they're shaped by colonial, here colonial Spanish attitudes and institutions, uh, most obviously the Catholic Church and its moral register. So both, as I'll be saying, both present a sort of judgment on colonialism, but the process of judgment or the mode of judgment is inflicted by or influenced by or filtered through uh, a form of judgment that is, is, is very clearly a, a Christian, specifically Catholic one. That doesn't mean that's the, it's on the only register here, but in some ways that's how these stories um, make themselves legible or make themselves heard to a wider audience. So they appropriate elements of, of Catholic judgment, turning it against the colonizers in each case. But we might also ask how much do they challenge it as well? So it's a question perhaps for discussion. I'll, I'll leave that open for the time uh, being. Let's look specifically, I'm just gonna get a few more minutes, talk about the, the Pongo's dream. So the, the Pongo's dream, you have a, uh, what we might call uh, the vision of a world turned upside down at the end. Right? That's its mode of, of judgment. Uh, the Pongo tells us this story in which uh, in, the after uh, in the afterlife, uh, angels come and uh, smear, first of all, smear the master uh, with honey uh, and then smear him, the, the Pongo, the servant, with excrement, uh, uh, with shit. And the sort of, the, uh, the joke at the end, right? The, the payoff is that then they are asked to lick each other uh, for all eternity. So we have a sense of that sorting of the sheep and the goats of, of, of judgment. We have a, a sense of a sort of at least quasi-Christian, quasi-Catholic uh, uh, afterlife. Uh, we also have elements here, though, of the Inca myth of Incari, which also is sort of is a messianic or apocalyptic notion of, of a, a final judgment or a, or a coming judgment. Uh, as well, we can think of, of popular events such as, as Carnival, which we've discussed earlier on in this course, um, which are uh, moments or times in which one can imagine a reversal. The world turned up and down, those who are high, low, those who are low, uh, lifted up uh, high. So here the dehumanized or animalized subaltern, um, the lowest of low, the pongo, the house serf, who we see being treated with, uh, treated as, as, as an object, as an animal, asked to, to bark and so on, gains a voice, right? speaks back to his master, uh, authorized by this shared vocabulary of, of judgment in the afterlife. And again, that's what enables him to speak, enables him to present this vision in which the tables are turned and the master is envisaged as quite literally eating shit. At the same time, though, the, the dream is just that. Right? It's a dream, perhaps a fantasy. And to some extent, we can think of the, the Pongo's dream to what does it, it, it refer? The Pongo's dream is, is what the story narrates, but the story itself is in some sense dreamlike is, is that the fantasy of, of speaking back so it's a sort of double dream the dream of being able to articulate one's dreams uh, to one's masters and uh, like any dream like any fantasy we can ask how much is it a form of symbolic compensation um, that sense of the dream being not real in some sense that perpetuates subservience to the ruling code of contact. Another way of thinking about this is how much, um, I mean, listeners might think, or readers might think, but, but listeners might think, well, a judgment is coming. Right? A judgment is coming in the afterlife. Uh, a judgment is coming at some other time, at some other place, in some other temporality. Uh, so uh, for the moment, there's no need for, I don't know, any kind of you know, organized, rebellion or concert, right? Uh, we don't get much sense of, I don't know, an indigenous community or a, or a social movement uh, 
uh, of any sort. We have the individual fantasy of deferred recompense or, or deferred justice uh, at some unknowable time uh, in the future. And then finally, and briefly again about the legend of the silent bell. This is a much more complicated story in, in lots of ways. Um, Agatis's story has its own complexities and, uh, and it would be worth talking uh, about that too. But just narratively, the, um, the Astoria story, the story that Astorias gives us is more complex, although it follows, at least in part, a similar structure of a final re reversal, right? Uh, the colonial bell is rendered useless. The translation here is the silent bell. Uh, in the Spanish, it's la cambana difunta, so dead or, or deadened. Um, and it's uh, rendered useless, it's, it's, it's killed off, its purpose is annihilated, thanks to indigenous self-sacrifice, or at least thanks to the fact that the self-sacrifice of the indigenous goes uh, unrecognized. Um, this is a story about both stories, I think, are stories about recognition or the failures or the refusal of, of recognition. I mean, both stories have this sort of metaphorical um, intent, I think. The Pongo is not just the Pongo. The Pongo represents more than the Pongo here. The uh, indigenous nun uh, also clearly uh, is, is marked as, as representing you know, an entire social stratum. Uh, that goes, uh, who, whose contributions to even the colonial project, right, the build the church, um, the institution and the architecture of the church goes uh, unrecognized. And that's a refusal of indigenous, of, to recognize indigenous labor, which, which is, and the indigenous contribution to, to the profits and, and riches that the Europeans skimmed off in their extractive project that is endemic to the colonial project and perhaps especially to the colonial project in, in Latin America. And perhaps now that the story is recorded and reproduced, and again we could perhaps say the same of Argetis' story, we might want to consider it as belatedly providing recognition that that's what, that's what Asturias and Argetas are interested in doing to provide the recognition whose failure the stories themselves uh, narrate. And yet, again, returning to what I was saying earlier, the transcription is arguably also a betrayal in some ways, right? A form of silencing, and perhaps partic particularly so in uh, Astorius' story, because Astorius figures, or rather uh, an ancestor, the name of Astorius, figures within the story itself. So it's sort of doubly signed, a sort of double appropriation of uh, indigenous voice uh, through recording and, and reproducing and reframing the story uh, for a different uh, audience. So again, perhaps this is you know, integral to or part and, and parcel of the, of the desire for the folk itself. And so in the end, perhaps both stories might be read of as allegories or metaphors, not just for the colonial experience, but for the sometimes unexpected consequences, even for what the well-intentioned, and we might imagine ourselves as, as well-intentioned also, the unexpected consequences for the well-intentioned letrado who is seeking out folk culture. They might be telling us the payoff may be, beware your wishes may come true. I mean, that, of course, is a very common trope in folk tales around the world, the, the notion of the poison gift. Um, the person who, you know, a genie comes or whatever, there's three wishes, and that seems to resolve that person's uh, troubles in some way or another, but the, you know, the, the, the wishes once granted turn out to be uh, more trouble uh, than they're worth. We, we have this, this desire, this wish to tap into, to understand, um, to share or have shared with us some aspect of folk culture, but we might find that something of a, a poison gift. Because after all, we are in the position of the Pongo's master, 
you know, Agedis' story, or in the story that Agedis gives us. We are eager to hear what the subaltern has to say, but in the end, the joke may be on us. <laughs>